Hello everyone, thank you very much. What I'd like to do this afternoon is share with you my journey through our culture and through music into the meditation world. As Anne said, they came together in my life. I didn't expect it. Uh, when I went to Paris to study music, the last thing I ended up or think, thought I would end up doing is getting into meditation, but it led straight into it. So I'd like to show you how I got there and also the changes in our culture over the centuries. Uh, the big changes and why music has changed along with the art and the ideas and the philosophies of our culture, which throws a lot of light on what's happening now, the kind of music that's happening now and the art and the turmoil that we're now going through in the last century and this century. I'm also sharing with you what I've loved all my life. I loved music ever since I was a little boy, discovered the piano. It actually saved my life. It was the life, you know, the surfboard that I hung into, hung onto all my life. And I discovered, as Anne pointed out, that both music and meditation are languages of emotion. They're very direct and they affect our bodies. And I hope this afternoon you have an experience of this. You'll feel how music touches you physically, quite literally. And meditation does the same in our inner lives. And this is why they are the same, because they are the languages of our emotions and the ways of exploring, understanding of our emotions. One of the things I always loved about music, especially when I was young, is you could explore any emotion right to its limit, which we're going to do this afternoon. Another thing I loved doing was with this instrument, you had the full permission of society to make a hell of a lot of noise. <laughs> and I love that too. <laughs> and so I'm going to do that this afternoon as well. Uh, you'll find for some people, some of the music is very different. I'll explain it as we go through. So you get to hear what's happening there. Now, as Anne said, I studied in Paris with the great French composer Olivier Messiaen, who died at the end of last century. I was looking for something and I didn't know what I was looking for. Don't know if any of you have had that experience. And it wasn't until long after I found it, in fact a very long time, that I understood what I'd been looking for and what it was. I'd experienced it from time to time and that was this, I can describe it now, but I just called it spacey at the time, this very still, spacious, timeless state. And when I first heard the music of Olivier Messiaen, I was only 18 and I was riveted because it went straight through my body. This shiver went through my body and I felt this feeling that I recognised because he could capture that in his music. You get it in music for time to time, but he really <coughs> caught it in a language that fits now. And this is the, one of the things I'd like to share with you. This vivid, luminescent quality which is timeless and completely still and one of, this is the great discovery of the meditation tradition, this state and the whole science and knowledge of the East is based on this experience. It's exactly the same as our science except our science deals with the outer world, their science dealt with the inner world and we're just beginning to explore that in our own culture. As they discovered, and as neuroscience is now discovering, a still brain is a happy brain. So I'm going to start by giving you a taste of this. Now Messian himself was a natural meditator, I discovered when I got to know him. He always meditated on precious stones before he started writing. And that luminous quality of colours flashing and changing is what comes through in his music. And he said, and this is why this picture is there, that his music is just like the stained glass windows of the Middle Ages. 
He called himself a man of the Middle Ages and he captures this quality in his music. So this first excerpt I'm going to play, it's only a short excerpt from the piece, is an experience in his music of the still quality I'm talking about. He was a devout Catholic, so this is his language, and he called this piece the view of God. So that's where we're starting, <laughs> right at the top. And he captures there this totally timeless overview which touches the whole body right through. So you've got the gut, the heart, and there's a bell ringing all the way through, just like in a meditation, to keep your mind alert. So this is an example of Olivier Messiaen and this quality I'm talking about. So that's a, an example of what I was talking about. With music, you have to be in the zone to do it. And so, like meditation, music is a state of getting absorbed. And I discovered when I was in Paris that meditation is our that music is our real meditation tradition, which has survived all the way through all the centuries. Because a performer has to be absorbed, draw the audience in, a composer is absorbed. In fact, all composers say they're not there when they're composing music. They all in different ways say, someone else did it, <laughs> it came through me. But we're going to start in the Middle Ages, which is why this is there, and they had a completely different view of looking at the world. Instead of seeing the world as we do as individuals and looking out at the world and everyone else, they felt themselves in it. You were not an individual, you were a part of society. You were your function in society. And the last remnant of this is the royal family in England. And um, royalty and the aristocracy, where your life is determined by where you are and who you are and where you fit. And they called this one, this age, the age of faith. It was 
very heart-based, based on feeling, relationship. But your outer life was very rigid. There was no freedom at all. As I said, you were what your position were. And this has survived in Tibet right up to the present day. It's a feudal society and they're both exactly the same. And this picture is one of the big rose windows in Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. And the way it's organised is it's a view of everything all at once around a central figure. So you can't see it, but in the centre is the Virgin with Child. So that's why it's called Notre Dame, it's Our Lady. And then all around it are all the things and stories associated with that experience. And this is a mandala and it's how mandalas work. They're a snapshot of a particular time with everything in it. They're not going anywhere, they're not doing anything, they're totally still, it's just this particular time with everything in it. Now it's a very natural, because if you look in nature, you see the same thing over and over, this centre point from which things radiate. In fact, it's how we're all born and it's how we grow. Uh, we start as a seed and then we grow and we end up with arms and legs and heads and things pointing out all over the place like the, like the uh, leaves around a flower. Um, Tibetan art, as I said, is exactly the same. You'll see the central figure is there and then it's built the same way in a big circle with everything associated with that around it. So a mandala is timeless. It's not going anywhere as I explained. It's quite still and it embraces everything associated with that time. Now in the 11th century you get this painting which looks quite odd to us because everyone's exactly the same size. It's completely flat. There's no sense of perspective at all because that's the way they saw the world. It's a way of what I was describing. You're just in it. There's no one outside it. Everyone in, who's involved is in the painting. This is the same in the 14th century. You get the same thing. This was a typical structure. You've got the virgin and child in the middle who's in hearts, but you'll see everyone else is the same size. There's no perspective in it at all. Then there was this massive change from the 15th century which went right through to the 17th century. The Renaissance culture began with the rediscovery of ancient Greek culture which had been declared pagan by the church and was dismissed and it was rediscovered and this completely changed our culture because they discovered mathematics, philosophy and the art of this time and it all combined to form perspective of things coming to a line, of actually a viewing point from which you were viewing. And this process of the Renaissance led into what was called the Age of Reason. And the difference is striking. This is in one century you get from this to this. Exactly the same structure of the painting, but what a difference. It's as though you are now looking into a scene instead of you being in the scene. And this was the great shift in the Renaissance, the creation of the individual. Now this painting is dedicated to Greek philosophy. Plato's there, Aristotle's there and Socrates is there. And so here we move to what they actually called from now on the age of reason or into the enlightenment. So we move from the age of faith which is based in the heart to the age of reason which is moves to the head. And one of the buildings which has survived from this period and was built at where this started and survived is still around now but it was the centre of power right through all this period is Versailles. And if you wanted to, you could do a window count of the structure and you'll find it's all lined up exactly. It's so reasoned, it's so worked out. 
everything balances. And then perspectives built in too with the way the gardens are laid out so that it creates a sense of perspective. Now, this is the period in which the composer Bach lived. He, he crossed the Renaissance into the Age of Reason. I've picked two major composers because Beethoven was exactly the same at the other end of this period. So this piece is a prelude of Bach. It's like a very reasonable conversation between two people. I'll show you how it works. Yes, the heart, and there's a little bit of gut there supporting it, but it's very much based in the head. So you've got these two people talking away. So here's number one. Person two answers. Number one. Number two. And the whole piece builds like that. So here we go. I hope you see what I mean. Very reasonable. Yes, the emotion's there. And you know exactly where it's going. It has a beginning, a middle, it's got a direction, and it's moving in that direction. Well, now we come to the end of this period, and it's very clear how the West set up this whole process of working and thinking in straight lines with a purpose, going to a goal. But the East had a totally different way, as I've explained, of looking at the world. They thought in circles, in complete pictures, the way I've described. So we now come, as I said, to the end of this period with Beethoven, who 
as I said, bridged the end of the age of reason and then the 19th century. And this was a period where this whole structure was breaking down. It was a period of revolution of, we're now at the end of the 18th century, of the whole structure of the aristocracy collapsing, of the French Revolution and the bourgeoisie starting to rise. And Beethoven was in the middle of this. And of course, one of the great symbols of this period is him, who's Napoleon. He, at the end of the French Revolution, after that, tried to unify the whole of Europe. And that picture typifies the will, the head, the reason, the direction, and the goal. And of course, this is all in Beethoven, who for a period really admired Napoleon and actually wrote a symphony, the third symphony, the Eroica, for, you know, in his name, and then he changed his mind afterwards. Um, when the op you know, thought it wasn't so good after all. Um, so let's now listen to a little bit of Beethoven. It's just a little excerpt, but it shows you how directed it is. But what it's got now that you don't get so much in, in, in uh, Bach is the gut starting to come in, the will, the sheer will starting to come in. So here's a little expert, an excerpt of Beethoven. As you can see, it's definitely <laughs> going somewhere. <laughs> and he knows exactly where he's going. And he gets there, no doubt about it. Well, after this, things completely changed. As I said, and here's a wonderful quote from Beethoven, when a composer is writing, they're totally absorbed. And there's a famous quote, because Beethoven was commissioned to write a violin concerto by the greatest violinist of the time who when he got it said this is impossible to play and refused to play it. <laughs> and Beethoven said, do you think I'm thinking of your violin when I'm listening to the angels? <laughs> <laughs> Which sums up perfectly this, period, this process of meditation and being completely absorbed. So as I've been saying in a different way, I'm now going to say it directly, music is mantra, meditating on sound. As I said, you can actually feel the music directly in your body. So there is music of the head, which we've been listening to. Then there is music of the heart, which we're going to. It can be warm, tender, sad. And then there is music of the gut, which is powerful, primitive and energetic. So after Beethoven, we come to the 19th century, which in music is called the Romantic period, where Composers completely changed the way they worked. Instead of following structure and reason, their whole aim was to follow wherever their emotions took them. So they brought into music the supremacy of emotion and intuition. Yes, the reason had to be there, but it went into the background. It wasn't the main thing. The other thing they brought into music was the gut. They worked on a big canvas, and this picture is a, one of the most famous pictures of the period. As I said, a, picture, uh, a period of revolution. But you notice they're following the feminine, the intuition, the feeling, the emotion. It's all about freedom, liberty, liberty, equality, and fraternity. This was the big catch cry. So the individual was now triumphant to the point that composers weren't following structures, they were going wherever they wanted to go. They were bringing into music what had been in the background or repressed, the immediacy of our instincts and of our guts. So as we found, Beethoven is very powerful and energetic, but it's very controlled by the head and reason. Now we get music which is the beginning of really bringing the gut energies in, expressed in their own way. Wild, primitive, and demonic. And 
the composer at the forefront of this was Franz Liszt. He was one of the most innovative composers in the history of music. He did the most extraordinary things. He was the first pop star, quite truly. He invented the pop star. He travelled with coaches and horses. He was swooned on by wherever he went. As soon as he walked into a room, all the women would swoon. He loved it. <laughs> And when I was young, I loved playing his music. It's like this, it is so extravagant. So you'll see again, we come to a completely different world. And he deliberately brings the demonic energies into music. So firstly, I'm going to play the beginning of a piece which he called Funerals. He wrote it as an elegy for the collapse, for the failure of the Hungarian uprising revolution of 1849. Now this, this section I'm going to play you is two pages long. It's all on one note. It's all based on one note. This one. It doesn't shift for two pages. <laughs> but he builds the relentless inevitability of a funeral procession just moving, it just builds, it's all emotion. There's practically no music in it at all. It's just doing the same thing over and over again, sitting on this bell at the bottom. I just want to show you musically something extraordinary he does. What he's doing down there is making this noise, which we never ever got in music before. But he's creating the effect of a huge tolling bell and this funeral procession. on that trumpet call and then goes through there. <laughs> oh, you can see it's just an effect, but what an effect. <laughs> and you can understand why a teenage boy loved playing that stuff. <laughs> it is so extravagant. <laughs> but that was the 19th century, an age of just taking emotion and really running with it. So I'm going to give you a few examples of this. This is the beginning of his sonata, his biggest piece in piano, which I did play when I was young. Um, and this is the very beginning of it, which starts with this very demonic feel. It just pulls you right in. Now, what he's done here, he's just laid out three ideas. They're not related at all. It's just bang, bang, one after the other. 
There's no direction, there's no purpose, just these three ideas which he's going to build with. Now, this very beginning, I'm going to show you the effect because it was a famous 20th century pianist who always sat down and counted to 19 before he played the first note. I'm going to do it and you'll see why. The audience thought he'd gone mad when he first did it, but this is the effect. from there. So I hope you could feel the effect of that and that holding it at the beginning of like that does really draw out the feeling of the gut and the, the demonic which he was creating all the time in his music. Now I can't resist playing you the main theme from this because it's uh, one of the biggest and noisiest although it's going to get noisier <laughs> as we go but it's one of these great, grand, extravagant 19th century statements. <laughs> that's, that's the big tune from that piece and as you can see it's a really big grand gesture. Now this movement went right through to the end of the 19th century and then right at the end again there was a massive change as our culture discovered Asia and Africa. And this had exactly the same impact on our culture as the rediscovery of Greek culture. And so we are now going through a period of another renaissance, exactly the same as back in the 16th century. For exactly the same reason, for discovering the, uh, another culture and other different cultures and then starting to reincorporate them. So what Debussy and all his generation discovered was Japanese art. And this is a famous picture by Hokusai of a wave. But as you can see, it's all feeling. It's sense experience. It's totally different from the way we paint. And Debussy actually wrote a symphony on the sea. And this painting's always been associated with it. So we're now moving to the senses as artists and composers and philosophers open right up to our sense experience. And Debussy defined music in this way. He said, music is the experience of the water, the play of curves described by changing breezes. And he came out and said, there's nothing more musical than a sunset. And so he was expressing this in music. Water and light play a big part in his music 
And so I'm going to play you an excerpt from a piece called Reflections in Water, and then his piece Claire de Lune, which means moonlight. And this was his contemporary, Monet, doing exactly the same thing, this whole series of paintings of water lilies, where the painting's not about the water lilies, it's about the play of the water and the light. So this is Debussy's, the beginning of Debussy's piece, Reflections in Water. As you can hear, it couldn't be more different from what we've just heard from Liszt. It's colour, it's light, it's movement, and it's so sensual, the same as this painting. Now, I'm going to play Moonlight or Claire de Lune for you. I'll play this time the whole piece. Thank you. 
which I think you'll agree is a gorgeous mm. piece of music. It's why it's just become so famous. Well, it captures everything this period stood for at the end of the 19th century. Well, at the beginning of the 20th century, as I said, there was a massive change as African art and music was discovered. The French, of course, had opened up their empire in Africa and all the artefacts started to come back to Paris. And it really affected the art and period of the period. And as I said, there was just as big a change as at the Renaissance. So this painting is by Picasso and it's a depiction of women <coughs> that you would never have seen in Europe before this. You can see the African influence, but it's also broken up, something that never happened before, the colours, the whole feel of Africa. And music changed so drastically at this point that it totally shocked the audience. It caught this feeling. This is the piece that completely changed it. As you can see, there's no tune, there's no harmony, it's pure colour and rhythm. To capture this feeling, it's actually Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, um, which was a, a ritual where a young girl was sacrificed by dancing herself to death for spring. Well, when this was performed in Paris, it was a ballet in 1912, it literally created a riot. They never really got through the performance, the audience. You can imagine respectable bourgeois Parisians suddenly being presented with this sound. They just didn't know what to do with it. It's become one of the most famous pieces in European history, of course. So we've now come totally to the gut. And now I'm going to concentrate on Messiaen, the composer. I loved from the moment I heard him because of what I said. He could capture everything and this is what's happening now from the 20th century on. Instead of just being focused on the head or the heart or the gut, at the moment we're focused on the gut, it's bringing them all together. We're all looking for love and all cultures have understood that. But in our culture, you only have the choice of sort of love without clarity or clarity without love. And the move that's happening bringing Asia, meditation, music, all the arts and sciences together is this movement of bringing all that together. And as you can imagine, it's a big move. And that's why it's causing such a turmoil. Now this is a piece Messiaen wrote. It's the beginning of a piece which he called a dance of joy but it is pure energy. This feeling of right in the gut, right in the earth, and just pure energy. Which of course is an experience of sheer joy, just the sheer energy of life. Now I want to play you this because I always loved playing it. It's another extravagant piece, but it is just bells. It's the different kinds of bells which Messiaen heard in Paris. There's nothing else going on. It's the pure sound of bells captured in his language. 
I warn you, at the beginning it's a shock, but if you open up and just listen, you'll hear what's going on. you enjoyed that. <laughs> I had audiences walk out on me when I, when I played that piece many, many years ago. But it's a wonderful capturing of the sound of bells, the pure energy of them, and the different kinds of bells. Well, what's happening now in our culture is the bringing back of all the things that were left behind in the Middle Ages. And so we come to a painting like this by Dali. It's actually the metamorphosis of Narcissus drowning in his own image. Very hard to tell what's going on at first glance, but if you look carefully, you'll see it. You can see it's caught that African feel, the influence of African culture. But what is extraordinary about it is that it's also gone right back to the Middle Ages and caught the feeling of this painting from the 15th century. This jumble of everything in there together, a very famous painting, it's Bosch's Garden of <coughs> Delights, Earthly Delights, but in there is the Garden of Eden, Heaven and Hell, everything at once. But you can see the kind of painting it is, is very similar to that sort of, it looks at first like a jumble, but everything's in there. So we're now going back to that sense of inclusion of everything, a very intuitive way. And this was the period, of course, when Freud and Jung discovered the subconscious, everything that had been repressed in us. And this came into view. And Freud's motto was actually, if I can't bring down heaven, I'm going to raise hell. And that's actually exactly what he did. It caused chaos and this went right through the arts. Now Messiaen was very, very influenced by all of this. And um, I'm now going to play you to complete this, uh, a whole piece of his, going back to where we started. This is a piece of the Virgin and Child. I'll show you how it works but it works in exactly the same way as a mandala. It has a central theme which does not change through the whole piece. It just sits there. And it represents, it's the same theme as the, what he called the theme of God, but of course it represents Jesus in the womb of Mary. That's why it's called the First Communion of the Virgin. And then it has around it everything associated with it. So it's got bird calls, it's got trumpets, but it's got the dance of joy when Mary discovers that she is pregnant. Um, so it brings us right back to where we started. But I'd like to show you this painting because this is a contemporary of Messian's, Marc Chagall, and his stained glass windows capture exactly the same feeling as Messian's music. As you can see, it's dreamlike. It's everything at once. It's not going anywhere. It's a whole world, beautifully coloured, floating images in space. And I'd like to quote you of something John said when he really heard Messian's music for the first time. He said, Messian's music is to Bach and Beethoven what quantum mechanics is to Newtonian physics. <laughs> now, it's absolutely true. This is the big shift that happened in the 20th century. Newtonian physics is all about objects going in predictable straight lines. Beethoven, Bach, the Renaissance. 
or curves, of course. But in quantum mechanics, the discovery was made that some atomic part, subatomic particles just appear in any one of any possible state. They can go anywhere and just appear. Well, this is how Messian's music works too. It's got a steel core, but around that, all these things come and go. And it makes sense, but it's a whole different way of thinking and looking at things. But if we go right back where we started, you'll see that's exactly what's going on here. Except now, there's reason. There's the gut. Everything else is in there as well. It's not just around a belief or a feeling. It's got everything there. So let me show you this piece I played right at the beginning. Is the theme which he called the theme of God. Here it is, right at the beginning of the piece. And that stays there for the whole piece. Doesn't change. But around it we have bird calls. We have trumpets. And we have a dance. He turns it into a dance. And then he goes right off into space. This dance just blows out to an infinite space because he takes this, turns it into these big chords, and then does an entire section on that. Which I'm warning you to let your mind go because if you do, you'll just feel it opening right up. And then he brings it right back to the heart and ends the piece quietly. So this is the piece which he called the First Communion of the Virgin. As I've said, it's exactly the same as this, the Virgin and Child in the centre, and then everything associated with that around it.
I've got another one if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> this is also by Messiaen. And this one he called, I sleep but my heart keeps watch. What an image. That is a perfect image of meditation, of just allowing your thoughts to quieten down. But that clear, acute awareness, just staying there. And of course, this is what is brought into our culture by meditation. So I'll just show a couple of things from this piece. It has a theme he calls the theme of love, which very simply, very Gershwin-esque harmonies in all of this from the 30s. Oh, sorry, that theme which comes through. And what he does in the middle of the piece, he builds this up to a moment of complete stillness. The piece just stops and he labels that ecstasy. It just rises to this point and stops there and it's at that moment I was talking about of sheer stillness and the thrill of ecstasy.